are weary and need rest, to all who mourn and long for comfort, to all who fail and desire strength, to all who sin and need a Savior. Christ Church opens wide her doors with a welcome from Jesus himself, the friend of sinners. life, our hearts are fully known. In Jesus' death, we finally have a solution. In Jesus' resurrection, we freely rest from striving. In Jesus' ascension, we are forever safe. Amen. Well, good morning, my friends, and welcome to Christ Church Oceanside. My name is Duncan, and I'm so excited to welcome you here. Thank you for joining us. We're meeting now in this place without walls. What is the mystical body of our Lord Jesus Christ, the church? And let me just say, you are so welcome and so wanted here. So thank you for being with us. This is the second week of Advent time. And so before we begin our worship today, we'll have a moment where we read aloud and pray the collect for this week. Traditionally, the second week of Advent is one that centers around peace, and so we will enter into this week, hopefully, a, a posture of meditation and reflection on peace. Peace of the Lord that is always with you. To be at peace in Christ. The peace that we desire for the world and the peace that Christ is bringing into the world through his work, even now. So I just invite you to have that posture in your heart as we pray together. Asking the Lord to bring more peace into your life at the moment. Maybe for the weeks looking ahead as we prepare for Christmas, the, uh, the shopping and the, and the time spent with loved ones, it can bring some stress as much as it is full of love and joy. And so peace for that, Lord. Maybe you've had a rough couple years as I mean, all of us have to some degree. Peace over that, Lord. And so in this prayer, let's just give it all over to Jesus. Let him take that weight off of your shoulders so that you only feel his yoke, the one which is easy and light and brings great internal peace. Let's pray. Blessed Lord, who caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning, grant us so to hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that by patience and the comfort of your holy word, we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which you have given us in your Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen.
Our Gospel reading this morning is from the Gospel of Matthew in chapter 6 beginning in verse 5 through to verse 9. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Pray then like this, our Father in heaven. This is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Praise be to you, Lord Christ. My dear friends, now that we have heard the word of the Lord read aloud and allowing its message to settle upon our hearts, let's now together confess our faith in the ancient words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is visible and invisible. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen.
morning, friends. It's Pastor Ryan here. Um, if you're watching this, you are either online or in person because today I will be preaching from my home for both uh, our online service and our in-person service. Um, if you have not heard, I have contracted COVID, as have some of my family members. Um, and so we, I attended an event a couple weeks ago that promised to follow uh, COVID guidelines and masking mandates and things like that, and then did not. And so we have ended up here. So I just want to thank you for your prayers, your support for us, a family of our size, in a house of our size. Uh, isolation does have its challenges, but for the most part, you know, we are um, trying to do it in good spirits, trusting and confident in Jesus for so it looks like I'll be another week before I can enter back into our in-person services. Now, today we are going to continue our studies here of the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6. Uh, last week we introduced the Lord's Prayer, which we will be studying through Advent and the Christmas season. We've got special guests joining us over the next couple months, next week, uh, sorry, two weeks from now. Bishop Trevor is going to be joining us, so I'm excited for that. And so what we want in this season is to be trained by Jesus in how to pray. Because Advent is a season of living in both the darkness, the reality of our broken world, but having hopeful waiting and expectancy that God is intervening in this darkness and has done so through the sending of Jesus and also through the second coming of Jesus. So the birth of Christ is at the center of our hope and the second coming is for the finalization of redemption um, in our world and in our lives. And so this idea of living in kind of the reality of this world, but appealing for his kingdom and for heavenly realities in the Lord's Prayer really suits well the season of Advent because it's the both. It's the now and the not yet. It's the here and it's the coming. And so we want to give ourselves to a deepening of this specific prayer that Jesus teaches us how to pray in. Now, if you're anything like me, your prayer life historically has been a bit of highs and lows. And so when we talk about prayer like this today, it automatically brings up some kind of default questions, whether we even want to engage with them or not. Do I actually want to learn to pray? Do I really feel like it's possible? <laughs> Do I feel like there's room in my life for this? Um, am I so demoralized by my experience with it that I don't even know if I want to try anymore? Or is it that you know, I've kind of got my thing, I do the same thing every day, and I'm good. But it doesn't satiate that hunger for more, that sense of true transcendence, of being with God, knowing God, and praying with your whole being. This is, I think, what we want to aspire to. And so when we look at a series like this, we can't help but ask, am I actually going to learn something? Or will it actually work? Now, prayer, it's important to understand that prayer is actually already happening in your life. Everybody's praying all the time. And in a place like Vancouver Island, where people are really actively searching, you know, for spiritual experiences and practices and ways, I think this is important to understand about prayer is that you're already doing it. And you're doing it all the time in your everyday life. Every time you find yourself feeling finite, which means you find your limitations and you're banging your head against those limits. It's like you're, you're running your day, doing the things you got to do, and then you hit your limit and you go, ah, I can't overcome this. I can't change this. I can't solve this. I don't understand this. That feeling that you come up against when you hit your limitations as a human, as a person, your natural instinct 
is to reach beyond yourself, to look for resources. And so just like your body craves the vitamins and minerals that it doesn't have, and you can feel your body craving the things you need, so does the soul. I've kind of discovered I have a need for a certain, I think, mineral or vitamin because I started buying carrot juice. No, I wouldn't say I've historically loved carrot juice, but I pour myself a shot of this carrot juice and I drink it and my body feels more invigorated and alive from that small cup of carrot juice than from another espresso. And so I've been noticing, okay, something's in here. Maybe it's vitamin A or maybe it's some of these minerals that I'm really craving. We've joked for years in Jackie's pregnancies um, that her craving is a bit more weird. And she's going to see this, I'm realizing, as I'm telling this story. But (laughs) where I crave carrot juice, Jackie used to crave concrete. And so what we started to realize is that Jackie's mineral intake or iron, things like that, was low when she was pregnant. And so she would crave just eating dirt or, or we would joke about her licking concrete. She never did that, but it was the, the craving was there. And so we find ourselves as humans going, I actually long for something I don't actually know that I want. So it's not that we're fully aware of our wants, but something in us innately desires and knows a deficiency when it's there. So every scroll of your phone, every sigh, every curse that is said, and every tear that shed, all of those things are prayers. We're we're emoting, feeling beyond ourselves, reaching and grabbing for something. And it's a recognition that I am not divine. I'm not sufficient in and of myself. And so I need the divine. I need God. This life is beyond me, but is not beyond another. So I'm looking for that other to help me and to provide for me. So what we then end up having to answer, every one of us, is two key questions. Who am I reaching for? And what does that person or or divinity or God want from me? So what am I reaching for and what do they want from me? Because all of a sudden I'm engaging innately in a relationship where there's a back and forth between us and we and I have to figure that out. Those are big existential questions, but they're actually really practical because they come up in the most normal, natural places of our lives, going through worry or through stress or through overthinking. We're looking beyond ourselves for resources. So these are really important questions for us, especially here on the island, because Vancouver Island is a very spiritually aware and focused context. People are coming here from all over Canada and the world. We have the First Nations traditions have existed here for 10 millennia. So there's deep rooted spirituality here. We have are retired populations who are seeking quieter internal lives after many decades of hard work and high stress. So there's a rediscovery of personhood that comes in and through retirement. Then we have younger folk, and younger folk are finding the beauty and the terrain of the island as a spiritual experience, as our everyone else. But there's something that draws the young here for adventure, for transcendence, and it leads to spiritual explorations. But the point is this, we all have this in common, is that all of us are desperate for help and resources beyond ourselves. And now our culture really pushes for a mosaic spirituality. And that's this idea that you can explore and piece together bits of all these different spiritual practices from all over the world and integrate new theories to form your own sense of dogma. This is my spirituality. This is my religion. These are my beliefs. And so we all become our kind of our own high priest of our own religion in a way. 
Now, this is just another form, though, of taking that need for something beyond us and turning it back on ourselves, where I now become responsible to provide this for myself. And so this makes me or you your own spiritual guru, where you have to then sift through all the world religions and spirituality and form your own new one. That may sound free, but it's actually a great deal of responsibility now being heaped upon you. And your all your soul, your spirit is already feeling the strain of too much responsibility. So much of our frustration and the futility that we experience with prayer is not knowing with conviction and confidence who we are praying to because we have formed God in our own image. We've made a religion that suits our kind of wants and needs and preferences, but then we have no help bigger than our wants and needs and preferences. So our frustration, the futility we feel in these spiritual practices, reveals the fact that deep down we know, I kind of made this God up. I made this religion up. I put these practices together. And so those deeper needs that really start to show themselves and go, we need real serious answers, aren't finding real serious solutions in this mosaic spirituality. So it's it's a risky business, I think, all of this, trying to form for ourselves these things. So then when Jesus comes in, Jesus is doing the opposite. Jesus is saying, I have the perfect knowledge of God because I am God. Jesus is coming in and saying, as the Son of God, I have eternally, been speaking with God in perfect intimacy. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, eternal happiness in closeness and conversation and mutuality and interaction. This is what Jesus is coming from. And then as a fully human man, Jesus epitomizes the ideal relationship between God and man. He is the definitive expert on human prayer, and on you as an individual. Jesus perfectly knows what prayer should be from both God's side and man's side, and God perfectly knows you and your unique story and your inner workings to train you and to bring you into that fellowship. That's wild. But then Jesus is also the high priest. So he presents God to us, And us to God, and in so doing, he oversees and cultivates the paths by which all of humanity would come to God through his sacrifice. So here's Jesus mediating as priest between God and man, as God and as man, but also as priest offering a perfect sacrifice to bring God and man together. And as our teacher, Jesus is clearly communicating to us what we need to know about this, about who God is and his character and what God wants, but also about ourselves and who we are and how to show up in this. And that's really the main point of those first few verses that we looked at, is Jesus is going, look, this is who God is. He's showing up honest. So you got to show up honest. you got to be truly yourself here. Don't put on a show for him. Don't try and use lots of eloquent words for him. He already knows you. But you've got to show up and be you in that prayer. Honesty, truthfulness. And that's the good and the bad. It's simplicity to go, I. this is who I am. These are my needs. And this is who you are. And I'm appealing to you. This is what Jesus wants. And so as our teacher, he's just helping make sense of all of this to go, there's a lot of noise out there, all sorts of crazy practices and all sorts of spiritual rituals and 
all kinds of temples and process and sacrifices and expectations on you. There's a lot going on in the world. Let me simplify it in a way that it works and it's easy to follow, but also it's transformative and transcendent. This is what Jesus is doing for us as teacher. He is talking it through for you and for me. But at the heart of all of it, the best way in which Jesus actually brings us into the act of prayer, fruit like prayer that's fruitful, and prayer that's intimate is actually through the role of brother. All of these other roles are huge and important and they matter and they achieve great things. But when Jesus is teaching you how to pray, he's actually coming to you going, all this is done. I have all of this in my you know, toolkit, so to speak. I am God. I am man. I am high priest. I am teacher. I'm all these things. And I'm bringing those to the conversation. But the way that I'm going to help you most is I'm going to teach you how to pray as your older brother. Because the first words of the prayer are that, our Father. And so there's two parts to that. The our is, number one, you're saying that with Jesus. We're also saying that with our other siblings, So that's important. We don't switch it to my Father in Heaven. It's our Father in Heaven because I am not my own. I'm a part of a society. I'm a part of a family. I'm a part of a bigger community. There is no isolated Christianity, even though we're going into our closets to pray in secret. We're showing up at our Father together. But most importantly here, you are praying our Father with and through Jesus. So I want you to imagine this. I want you to imagine that prayer is a conversation that's actually starting with you and Jesus. And Jesus is prepping you. He's getting you ready to speak to God. And so what he's doing is he's kind of got you outside of the heavenly throne room. And he's talking to you here on earth saying, okay, we're about to enter into this. And you're going, how do, I, how do I even start this conversation, Jesus? How do I talk to God, the perfect, holy creator of the universe? You should be rightly freaking out a bit. And so there's this trepidation to go, I've got these needs in my stupid little life. And you want me to bring those to God eternal, God almighty, God creator, God beyond all things, as if he's going to care about these things. There's so many reasons I want to talk myself out of going to prayer. Some are that I'm not worthy of this. Some are that God must not care about this. Some are just, I don't know how to do this. Those thoughts are first a conversation with Jesus. You're bringing that out in your relationship with him going, I don't know about this. I don't think I can do this. I I don't know if I want to pull the trigger on this. Maybe I can find some other resources in and of myself to just keep going. But Jesus is going, no, 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 no. Come with me. We're going to the source. We're going to the creator of the universe. We're going to the one who knit you together in your mother's womb, the one who sustains your very breath, the one who is at work in the space between every one of your atoms holding you together. We're going to go to him, and I'm going to tell you what to say. I'm going to tell you how to say it. Because this is the way I say it. This is what I call him. This is what I do. And still, all the parts of me, I don't, I don't deserve this. I don't know about this. Jesus is saying, I've got all those pieces covered. You don't even have to understand it all. But as God, as man, as priest, hear me, brother. Hear me, sister. I got this. I've got all those pieces covered. You come with me and repeat after me. And so he takes you and you stand before the Father, your heart, your soul, your whole being, your very existence, your past, your present, your future is all in one place before God outside of time. And all it takes to get there is to say what Jesus says, which is to say, 
our Father. The moment you say that, wherever you are in the world, you are transported to being before him. Our Father Jesus takes you, unites you to himself, and presents you to the Father, going, here is one of my siblings. I made them a sibling. And so to call God Father is to believe in Jesus enough to say, Jesus has made me a son, or Jesus has made me a daughter. I am his. The point is primarily not on what you are, but on what God is. And God is Father. And this is how Jesus knows him. And for you to use that language is the most audacious thing you could ever aspire to. But it's all backed up by the achievements and personhood of Jesus. That because of who Jesus is, we must, we have to speak this way to God because God's will is Jesus and God's accomplishments are Jesus and God's heart are Jesus and God's salvation for you is Jesus and that makes you his son or daughter. That's just the truth. The ultimate reality of the world is that God has saved you in Jesus and brings you to himself as his beloved child. And just to say, Father, is to, is to be in Christ and to be known by God, and to have all of your needs met. Yes, it's audacious, but also we don't have a choice because we've seen what we've seen in Jesus. And to not say it, to not be audacious, is to say that Jesus has not completed what he promised. Think of the world-changing reality of this moment where Jesus is saying, call God Father and own it. Because this is actually the Father's will. This is what moves the Father's heart. This is how he wants to be approached and wants to be known. Call him Father in, in every situation. In every hardship and pain, in the dark, where no one can see you and no one knows what's going on, call him Father. That is the beginning of true Christian prayer, is to just call him Father. And to all of us who go, but Jesus, you know my dad. You know my earthly father. You know he never helped. You know, if I showed weakness, he would crush me. You know, if I showed failure, he would reject me. You know, he caused more harm than good for me. And Jesus would say, I know all of that, but the cure for that, the healing for that, is that you would exchange that for my father, who will never do that to you. If you ask for bread, will he give you a stone? If you ask for eggs, will he give you a snake? This is the safest father in the universe. This is the father who loved you before you were born. This is the father that knows every moment and second of your life and loves you. This is a father that will never abandon you and never harm you. This is a father who is steadfast love and faith. And so all of that, be honest and let Jesus bring you to God where he, by faith in him, you can say and utter the words, Abba, Abba, our Father. Hear the cry of my heart that where I am reaching in the midst of my limitations is to my Father. That's what I was made for. That's why it's innate. That's why it happens by default. But put a name to the one that we were going for, that we are reaching for. It is our Father. It is not just some far-off benevolent being universal spirituality. It is a name. 
It is our God. It is our creator. It is our father. And our inner being resounds and responds to go, this is the one I've been looking for. I don't want to make my own religion. I don't want to make shift some spirituality. I want a dad. I want to be loved. I want to be provided for. I need real help. I need training. I need to feel like I'm coming home. But I pray in the midst of my darkness, I need to know I'm coming home. This is the beginning of the Lord's Prayer. This is what it means to say our Father. is specific. It captures the heart of God, the true nature of God, the way in which God wants to be known, and at the same time writes us, makes us in, into who we were meant to be. It's a salvation prayer. Because I feel like an orphan in this life in my sin. Take care of myself, fight for myself, protect myself. Nobody cares about me but me. Insane father, I'm saved from that orphanhood. And I'm righted into what I was made for, which is a beloved child. This is my sweet spot. This changes every situation just by saying father, because I'm no longer an orphan without resources. I'm now with my father and no darkness can prevail against him. I'm now in Christ and no evil can overcome him. This changes everything just to say father, father. All of heaven becomes available to you, my brother and sister, when you say, Father. All the resources that made the, the existence of the world become available to you when you say, Our Father. All of heaven comes alive when we say, Our Father. And all of heaven is present when we say, Our Father. As we labor and travail in this life, as we see darkness continue to seem to win, the greatest revolutionary act is for the person to not rage against the darkness. It's not for us to try and overcome evil in our own strength. The greatest world-changing thing that we could do is begin to say, Our Father, in the midst of the darkness. And in doing so, we're brought to him and he to us. He is seeing, we're seeing him rightly and seeing ourselves rightly. We're recognizing we're not of this, we're of him. And as we begin to pray the rest of the prayer, the most transformative, impactful things take place between us and between God as a beginning of transformation to our situations. But it hinges on those first two words that we all must begin to say, because of who Jesus is, and who he reveals God to be, we pray, our Father in heaven. Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
upon its instruction laid out by our pastor, Ryan Matchett. We have sung songs of worship and praise to the Lord. So now let's end our time together by taking a posture of confession and repentance. By all the things that we have done and all that we have left undone, we confess them freely to our Lord and ask for his forgiveness which in turn he freely and graciously gives. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon us, pardon and deliver us from all our sins, confirm and strengthen us in all goodness, and keep us in eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Now having confessed our sins and been assured of God's gracious and unending forgiveness, let me leave you now with a final blessing. Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Thank you for being with us, Christ Church Oceanside. Have an incredible week.